Greetings, brothers and sisters. So at the end of this video, I'm going to cover Britney Spears and a few more celebrity things. But at the end of this video, I have something that blew me away, and I talked to my wife about it. I had a realization about the economy, and I've talked about how we've been screwed before and how this is a Ponzi scheme. But this will um, really, uh, you know, well, let me, I'll come back to this, but it is something that I think is a substantial realization about what's really important. But first, let's get to this. One of my viewers sent me this uh, yesterday morning. It's Britney Spears and her baby. Look at her go. Britney, that's the free Britney for you. That's Britney free. <laughs> this is Britney Unchained. She posted a series of naked photos, and then she posted this with her baby. Don't stare at it too long because it's It'll pull you into some Britney land. It's very hypnotic. It's, um, I had a baby, y'all. I'll be taking some time off shooting at home every day. Her nursery is beautiful, and her name is Brennan. We even look alike. My first. I'm turning 40 this year. Age is nothing but a number. But seriously, growing up is the dumbest thing you'll ever do, so play on, my friends. Brittany, you are one of the few people who can keep the inner child alive. I'm confused, but it's okay. <laughs> Queen of humor. She's so precious. So, um, you know, that's what you get with a free Brittany. Like, it's just... <laughs> you think any of the free Brittany moron army, right, <laughs> is concerned that a 40-year-old woman has a doll, a plastic doll? And she's dancing with it like a crazy person, you know, that maybe there's um, a reason why she needed to be, you know, helped. <laughs> Not that I'm saying the conservatorship was good because they were just stealing her money. But, you know, like this is also disturbing. But also she went in on her family. This picture is everything to me. It makes me want to cry. She's saving her divine feminine sister. I suggest if you have a friend that's been in a house that's really small or for months, no car, no phone, no door or privacy, and they have to work around 10 hours a day, seven days a week, and give tons of bloody week, give tons of blood weekly with never a day off, I suggest strongly you go pick up your friend and get them the hell out of there. If you're like my family who says things like, sorry, you're in a conservatorship, probably thinking you're different so they can F with you. Thankfully, I found an amazing attorney, Matthew Rosengart. <laughs> her sister didn't come save her, but Matthew Rosengart did. <laughs> Who has helped change my life. Everyone needs a Matthew U. Rosengart in their life. Dog the Bounty Hunter claims laundry has a demonic past. Obsession with the dark side. When this guy thinks you're demonic. <laughs> uh, Cheryl Burke clear to return to Dancing with the Stars set after COVID-19 battle. Okay, so I've got some great news. I have been officially... Dancing with the Stars is canceled. Officially cleared. I am back to normal. No more quarantine for me. Unfortunately, though, um, Cody... Oh, Cody. What's up with Cody? Is still in quarantine. Come on, Cody. Get your guests together. But he will be back in Los Angeles starting Friday. Okay, good, because we were going to miss Cody. What's Dancing in the Stars without Cody? Charlie Sheen, Denise Richards' daughter, claims she was trapped in an abusive home and not living, and she's gone to live with Charlie Sheen. No, I ask you not. Her daughter here, their daughter, a year ago today, trapped in an abusive household, hated myself, would go days without eating or sleeping, insanely depressed, hated school, etc. She's so, she's crying in this picture. And now finally moved out of that hell house, had a spiritual awakening, owned two cats, happily single, full of self-love, dropped out of high school. There's more pictures. And so, how bad is that house that's, that moving in with Charlie Sheen 
<laughs> how how much of your house of hell is it if you have to move in with Charlie Sheen to get like some peace and sanity? This is Sammy Sheen. Looks a little bit, um, you know, scary there. And she's had some sort of realization. And an Instagram model, I guess. And then there's this. Dressing up in these demonic Playboy um, outfit and dangerous woman. Apparently she's 17. And did you know that Charlie, Charlie Sheen's kids were going to end up like this? So let me get into the economy thing. This is, I think, going to blow people away. Democrats split over how to pair Biden agenda as $3. trillion price tag falls. And so um, this is, you know, he wanted to marry some infrastructure in with a, you know, bailout for basically poor people and, you know, other types of Democrats that he wanted to have a big payout for, and that's being rejected. And again, they just had a, a couple of other bailouts with Trump. So this would put it up to, I believe, with Trump bailouts and and the Biden bailouts, I believe this was going to be up to $12 trillion in, in bailouts. So the first thing to understand is that as of January 6, 2020, the Federal Reserve had around $4 trillion printed. Two years ago in uh, 19, uh, 2018, it was at $1.4 trillion, right? So they've been printing money like crazy, some of it under Trump. But now as of January 4, 2021, it's up to $6.2 trillion. And so that's the amount of money that's out there, printed money. You know, again, it's not worth anything. But it's a promise to pay. And I've covered this before, right? Our money is the government promising to make good on $6.7 trillion of printed paper that's being used to buy stuff, right? So how the hell are you going to have a bailout that is $3.5 trillion? So here is the average uh, tax revenue. And so for 2020, 20, it's going to be an estimated $3.7 trillion. It was 3.6, 3.46, and 3.33 in 2018. Now, this is odd because, you know, the economy closed down for a period of time, but they've raised taxes. But again, this $3.7 trillion is the complete amount of income the U.S. government has to spend, right? I've talked about this before. So you go to the U.S. national debt clock, and how are you going to pay back $28 trillion? And the interest is just, you know, I've done this before. We can wait till it comes around to a million dollars here. And I will um, count and see how accurate my counting is, but here we go. Ready? One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, Eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, fourteen, fifteen, sixteen, seventeen, eighteen, nineteen, twenty. And now that's another million dollars, right? So it's about twenty two seconds by my counting. So, you know, every um, minute there's about three trillion dollars of interest compounding. Three, three, I'm sorry, three million dollars per minute of interest compounding and adding to the national debt. And so when our income is $3.7 trillion and our total amount of money available is only 6.7, how could you ever pay back 28 trillion? But that's just the national debt. That's what the government owes. That's what our government owes. $88,000 per person we all owe to pay for this national debt. But it gets worse here. The U.S. total debt is $84 trillion. So when there's only $6.7 trillion in America in cash, right, that's the only real money there is, and that isn't worth anything. That's not gold. That's not the value of gold. That's the value of American promise to pay, right, with the inflation going up. 
the dollar value is going down, but there's not enough money to pay off this. There's not enough money to pay off this debt, not enough money to pay off that debt, right? Total personal debt is $21 trillion. And so these are completely different levels of, this is a bank interest we've seen. Look, there's a 666 here. I guess that's six, 666 billion in bank interest. And so, um, you know, you look at all this red all over the place, right? And so in terms of, um, this is how much we owe right now this year for Medicare. It's one point. $3 trillion, Social Security, $1.1 trillion, and the national defense is $733 billion, but that ends up at $1.7 trillion every year. And again, a trillion is a thousand billion, right? <laughs> and so a billion is a thousand million. And so when you're talking about these kind of numbers, you can't even really conceive of what that is, right? A quadrillion is a thousand trillion. Our income, again, right here's the, it's um, $3.8 trillion US federal tax revenue. So we might get up to $4 trillion this year because they're taxing the crap out of people. I'm not sure because business is, you know, down, right? The, U, the gross national product, I mean, there's supply chain issues, all these things, right? But in terms of like, just think about this for a second, you have this amount of income and that's already covered by Medicaid, Social Security, and defense budget. And that's not counting all the other stuff and these bailouts that they're just putting out there. So it's impossible to pay any of this back, right? This is all promised to people. Like there's all this stuff promised to people. In unpaid liabilities, promises that the U.S. government has to American people in terms of future Social Security is $21 trillion. Medicare liability is $33 trillion, right? And we've only got $6.7 trillion, you know, of total currency. And this is $50 trillion right here. This is unpaid, unfunded liabilities. Is These are all the promises that the American people think the government can pay for, right? That's $157 trillion, right? And so there's only a limited amount of monopoly money out there, $6.7 and it can't cover any of this, right? It can't certainly cover this national debt. It can't collect, it can't cover our collective total debt, right? All of it. And it's debt itself. And then there's the this is the currency and credit default derivatives that are out there. And that's um six hundred trillion dollars. And so there's all this promise, like all this value out there, right? This is all value. People think that they uh, you know they're promised something. And the, the money itself, they can't make good on. Just $6.7 trillion. They can't even make good on that promise. You know, you understand this? That the dollar is, we promise that we're going to make good on this dollar. That's what the, you know, promissory note means the on the back of the dollar bill. And they can't make, with that $6.7 trillion of promise to pay, they can't do any of this stuff, right? So they really don't know how much physical money there is in the world. They have to calculate it, right? But this is, you know, a pretty close estimate that there's 36, um, almost $37 trillion worth of currency in the whole world. So if they took all the currency that's available in the world, they could pay, you know, this down. Again, that would be all the money going to this debt. And that wouldn't go to anybody else, right? That's everybody emptying their pockets, and there would be about $10 trillion left over, $9 trillion. But they couldn't pay this, $8 trillion. They certainly couldn't pay these together here, the Social Security and Medicaid and, and U.S. unfunded liabilities. And these are promised over you know, a long period of time, but they're still promised, right? The government's on the hook to provide Social Security and Medicare for people, and they can't do it, right? They can't, you know, this is like why they don't want, you know, veterans to survive the war because they're on the hook to pay their, you know, their medical bills and everything, right? Pay them you know, a certain amount of money for being in war and they don't want to pay. They don't have the money. This is why they need huge population reductions because they promised all this stuff and they can't deliver because it's a Ponzi scheme. This is an illusion, right? 
the money system is an illusion. And now there's limited amounts of physical currency, and that's not worth anything, but at least it's something tangible you can hold in your hands. That $6.7 trillion of currency isn't enough to make good on everything. You understand this? They could only pay, you know, when you only have $6.7 trillion of total money. So if everybody emptied their pockets and we got all the money together, say, all right, let's pay off some of this debt, we couldn't even make a dent in it. So that's how to, out of whack and out of balance. Of course, there's digital currency, but that's all an illusion as well, right? That's not real money. It hasn't been printed. It's value that people think they have. And so another good example of this is there is $7.4 trillion billion worth of Bitcoin. Now, I remember when Bitcoin was, um, was uh, 10 cents. <laughs> I remember when people in the truth community were paying each other in Bitcoin, people would give their friends a bunch of Bitcoins to go buy a pizza or something, right? People were using this as like currency. Various truthers were talking about it. I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about it because I'm old, right? And so then I remember when it was $100. And then now it's up to $54,000 of Bitcoin. It's up and down, right? And so... All those people who are Bitcoin millionaires, where did that value come from, right? When Bitcoin went from 10 cents of Bitcoin, or even less than that when it was first came out, right, and all the other cryptocurrencies combined, when they went from, you know, whatever they started off to, to now being, you know, Bitcoin increasing so many times, like, I mean, what's the, you know, how many times does 10 cents go into 54,000, right? And so it's increased astronomically. So where did all that value? You got all these people that now think that they have, you know, they have um, millions of dollars in Bitcoin. Where's that money going to come from? Like they didn't print more money to compensate for your Bitcoin going up astronomically. And so now the government wants to tax Bitcoin. They want to tax this stuff under the idea of unrealized capital gains. They want to just tax people on whatever value their Bitcoin's increased, right? And the value of your home. Let's say you buy your home and you bought a house for a million dollars just because it's a round number. And now it's up to, its value is up to $3 million. It's appreciated. And now you think you're owed $2 million extra dollars for the value of your home. Where did that $2 million come from? right, that appreciation, because it didn't mean that the government printed an extra $2 million to pay you the value of your home, right? And so the government has all this appreciation, especially for the boomer generation. They have all the stuff they promise, Social Security. They have all the Medicare, all the things that they've promised to all of us, right? We're all paying into Social Security, and we retired, and boom, they got to pay it back to everybody, you know, going to the you know, whatever that was, $20 trillion or whatever it is, promised liabilities in the future, they're, they're on the hook to pay all this value out, right? And so you, when you have all these people whose houses have appreciated in value and they can't pay, they can't pay everybody what they're think, what everyone thinks they're owed something, that they, there isn't enough money to go around, right? There isn't enough value to go around. The derivatives market is even worse. And the derivatives market and Bitcoin you know, the stock markets and things like this, it's not based in anything real. It's just based in what people are willing to pay for something, right? And so someone's willing to, you know, buy your your Bitcoin from you at, you know, $54,000 when you paid 10 cents. Sure, you're getting their money, but the value of the complete Bitcoin, you know, Bitcoin, whatever it started off in terms of its collective value and what it's evaluated at now almost a, a trillion dollars. I mean, it's crazy amount of money, right? I mean, the billions of dollars that Bitcoin is now worth, $742 billion, that's only, you know, that's uh, three-fourths of a trillion dollars. And so when there's only $6 trillion of currency and there's almost, you know, there's almost, uh, there's $6.7 trillion of currency and there's almost $1 trillion of Bitcoin, right? And that's going to, you know, continually appreciate because of the way that they're running that market. 
So where does all that value come from? How are they going to pay off all of this debt, all of these promises they made to the American people with only $6.7 trillion, right? They can't. It's so far out of whack. It's a Ponzi scheme. Like when they have a Ponzi scheme, a pyramid scheme, and it starts to collapse, the guys are like, you know, trying to get out of town before the cops get involved. And people realize they've been flim flammed, right? A flim flam man goes in, works. You know, if you ever seen the George C. Scott movie, Flim Flam Man, he goes to a town, he works the town and he has a bunch of scams. He gets the hell out of there, before, you know, after he's ripped everybody off before they wake up, right? You know, these um, you know these Ponzi schemes and things. But it's like, you know, the bookie, you know, the bookie is the one who's in debt and they just have to take your stuff away or get rid of you so they don't owe you the money. You know, I worked in a an Italian restaurant. There was a very Italian woman, like really looked really Italian, was my coworker. She was probably about 10 years older than me. And we used to work in pairs, like a front of the staff and a, a back of the staff, right? We made food at the table. So it was like, you know, we made Caesar salads and things and other stuff right at, you know, table service. Anyway, so I was paired up with her, and we, you know, a couple of times, and we were talking. And she said, you know, she had just broken up with her boyfriend. They'd been together for about 10 years. So um, it was the year the Washington Redskins won the Super Bowl, and they scored like 50 points. It was like the Broncos, I don't know who it was, but they just destroyed the other team. And her boyfriend was a bookie. And he maybe went to the Super Bowl or something or whatever it was and left her in charge of handling the bets. And everybody bet on the Washington Redskins. And when you're a bookie, like you have to adjust the point spread. You want money on both sides, right? You want ten thousand dollars on uh, the Redskins and ten thousand dollars on the Broncos or whoever they beat. I can't remember. It might have been the um, the Bills or somebody. It's probably the Bills. But what you want everyone to bet on is um, like there's a time. Like people go in. All right, I'm going to bet five times, and each time. The person is betting $6 to win five. So if they win, they get paid five. If they lose, they have to pay six. So they're already screwed, right? Because even if they win, they go 50-50, they're still going to lose a dollar on every time that they bet. And so if the bookie, right, gets um, 10,000 time bets on the Bills and 10,000 time bets on the Redskins, then they're going to walk away with $10,000 no matter what happens. But that's not what happened for this woman, because no matter how much she raised the point spread, like it started off at like 10 and she brought it up to like 15, people were still betting, giving away 15 points, right, that the Redskins would outscore the Bills by 15 points, and they outscored them by like 30. And so they got killed. They lost like 20 grand or something, right, back in the, you know, the the 80s, late 80s, early 90s. And so that's what's happening with the economy because the bookie now has to come up with 20 grand and maybe they don't even have it, right? Or it's like the person who bets all this money and the bookie comes around, they don't have the money to pay them. That's what our government, they've promised all these people, you know, everyone thinks that they're going to have their needs taken care of and there's not enough money. So they have to depopulate and they have to take away people's value, what people are promised, right? So if your house is... um, appreciated by a hundred thousand dollars or a million dollars they have now they're trying to pass a tax a uh, a capital gains tax that isn't about they're not waiting for you to sell your house or your bitcoin they're going to say oh wow you you got a million extra dollars in bitcoin we're going to take five hundred thousand we're taking half of that it's 50 percent tax something like that right they're proposing this so let's say people's houses have appreciated and people like wow look Look at how much value we have in our house. They'll say, all right, you owe us half of what you your house is appreciated. And so if your house is worth a million dollars, you paid five hundred thousand, you owe the government two hundred and fifty thousand on the, you know, five hundred thousand that your house is appreciated, right? Your house was five hundred, now it's a million. You've made five hundred thousand dollars in terms of appreciation, and the government wants two hundred and fifty thousand dollars now. They're going to force you to sell your house because you don't have the money, right? And you're like, wait, how's this happening? And so 
you know, they're trying to grab everybody's land this way and get rid of people what they think they're owed in terms of your pension, in terms of your Social Security, because there's not enough money to pay off all the things that people think they're entitled to based in a, an economy that's a scam. And so this is why everything's happening. Everything that's going on right now is about that and nothing else, right? <laughs> it's about the fact that this Ponzi scheme, this debt-based economy is so insolvent and out of whack that they have to get rid of people's, you know, the debts they owe to people. Like they're on the hook for all of this debt, right? The government, $28 trillion they owe banks and whatever to keep the economy afloat. All the, you know, the yearly budget is more than the income, right? $3.7 trillion in income this year, but the budget is going to be like $8 trillion, right? So like every year we're just adding to debt. We have to borrow more money, print more money. The value of the dollar is plummeting. It's, you know, they're trying to keep it up, you know, fake it, fudge the books, but it's not, you know, it's a scam. This has always been a scam. And now the flim flam man is leaving town, you know, with everybody thinking they're owed things and promised things that they could never deliver on. The flim flam man is the American economy and the people who control it. So they have to reduce population and they have to steal people's stuff, right? They have to get rid of value, things that you think you're promised because they can't pay you, right? So they just steal it and say, yeah, we, you know, we're going to tax this. Instead of giving you money, we're going to tax, they're going to tax money that you don't have, right? And they're going to buy all the hard assets, you know, all the land and property and, you know, commodities and things. And then the economy is going to be rebooted in some way. And everybody who thought they were rich is going to be poor. Everyone who thought they was poor, who everyone who was poor is going to be even poorer. And the people who control the system are going to have all the, you know, they're going to own and, and control all the things that are important. Land and apartments and, you know, businesses and things. And everyone else is going to be just renting, right? This idea of by 2030 that nobody will own anything. This is how they're going to do it. But it's not going to work out because there are things that are going to happen that are going to collapse this system. The problem for the controllers is the Kali Yuga's ending and their power is done, right? They're, you know, there's no version of this where they get to keep control of the global system. You know, by the end of this century, they're gone, right? They're whatever. It's going to be, um, you know, it's going to be a completely different power structure, I think, by the end of the century. But whatever it is, the end of next century, I mean, it's, you know, very, it's very close for them. So no matter how they restructure, restructure this, you know, every solution that they have, plus people are waking up and they've run scenarios on this and they knew that by, you know, this time there was no way of stopping people from waking up to what was going on. Like that's, you know, that's, they know that already. So there's no real out for them. They don't have a win. They can't somehow fix this for themselves but they're trying but it won't work so that's what's going on right now you know i've used this example before when you have a like a musical artist like michael jackson or prince or john lennon or you know elvis they get to a point in their career where they're no longer going to produce any creative material any content right just with art like artists right you know you have this with artists as well who are you know they're past their ability to produce quality art. And if the artist dies, their art becomes astronomically more valuable, right? As soon as an artist dies. It's the same thing for these musical artists and even some actors, people who have lots of royalties out there, right? Every time somebody plays a Michael Jackson song in a movie or something, he gets royalties. Plus he owned the Beatles, you know, whatever, he bought the Beatles collection of music, right? And so... You know, or like with, um, say, something like Seinfeld or Friends, those actors are getting royalties every time people stream one of those shows or something. And so if they're not producing any more content, they're no longer producing anything of value, the actor or the musical artist or the artist, the artist, artist are more valuable dead, right? So the powers that be, the financial people can come in and grab all their stuff, right? And make money off their 
royalties and things. I mean, think about when Michael Jackson was blowing his money and all these things. So instead of allowing the person to, you know, someone like Britney Spears in conservatorship. And so they're better off controlled or dead, right, rather than let them blow through their fortune where their fortune can be utilized, you know, can be used by the people that control the money system. And that's why you see a lot of these artists have mysterious deaths because they no longer, um, you know, can do anything for their controllers, the money managers and people that control them, the families themselves. But their body of work that they've already produced is worth a fortune. And so they, you know, their ownership of that body of work is the issue. And so they have to be taken out and then, you know, they can divvy up the remaining loot, right? And that's what's happening to America. Like America is done. It's a shell of itself. There's no, right? The American people are a disaster. The system's a disaster. The infrastructure's breaking down. And there's just too much um, entitlement. And people think they have, you know, they have valuable stuff that's not worth anything. There's not enough money to make, you know, good on all the promises. So the American system has to be, you know, like I said, whoever won this presidential election was going to be in charge of looting what's left of America, like the America going out of business sale. You know, when these corporate raiders, like the, like, you know, the example of Gordon Gecko in that movie Wall Street or the um, Richard Gere character in Pretty Woman, they buy up companies, right? These corporate raiders buy up companies and sell off the pieces for value. They're more valuable being split up and sold off like this. And that's, you know, what's happening in America. America is done being the world's economic and military power. It's just that we don't know it yet, right? <laughs> you know, like the other people do. It's the end of the, the empire, the British empire as well. And so this is how they're, you know, this is how they're bringing that reality to all of us. Like, you know, Americans would never accept that if they were told that. I mean, many of you can hear this. Like, it just too dist it's too distressful to hear it. And so people go into denial, so they need some other way to bring Americans to their knees. And that's why I say only spirituality will save this world, because the economic, we can't fix it with money, we can't fix it with... The American people are, you know, so mi messed up and miserable, and the morality and unnatural and unspiritual, disconnected from God, the family's been broken down. I mean, there's all these other aspects to it. The system's imploding. It's what always happens when you have a, a system that goes in a demonic direction. And there's no version of this where the system gets to be saved, right? So the system has to collapse. There's no other choice. Empires collapse. This one's collapsing. And then we have to build something better, right? We have to build back better, right? But not, you know, the way Joe Biden thinks. We have to bring God into it. And we have to create something different. That's, you know, unlike this demonic system that's based in divine principles. It's the heartfulness meditation I talk about. The people are connected to God internally, everybody, and they behave better. They, you know, they form their their morals and ethics and things, and they become better people. And because of that, they manifest a better system with God as their partner. So only spirituality will save this world. It's Paul Romano, definitely important for the apocalypse. And the ascension. Everyone have a blessed day and be grateful.